What does Night in the Woods hide off camera from the player? Now you may be thinking, wait, that's a 2D game. Yes, but the world is constructed in 3D. In this video, we'll be diving through towns, dreamscapes, hidden areas, and all sorts of other unseen goodies in this quest through honestly one of my favorite games. Like, did you know that maze dreams have hidden interactive doorways that warp you outside of the map? There's a whole lot more than that, so I hope you enjoy this behind the scenes look at Night in the Woods as we focus on Greg's story alongside the town of Possum Springs and May's spooky dreams. So normally, I start these videos with a recap of the series of events the player would go through, so everyone remembers what's going on in each area in the game, but that would take a long time given how this game works and all the times you revisit areas. So I'll try something different. Night in the Woods is an existential, melancholy spotlight on the Rust Belt towns of America and finding purpose. A story in which our character May arrives back from college to her childhood town Possum Springs. She resumes the life she left, and often does the same thing day in and day out. You choose to either hang out with B or Greg, as the adventure transpires. And your decisions impact how these characters perceive May. You travel through dreams and haunted locations as you try to figure out who you are as a person, and to unravel a strange mystery in the town. And as someone who grew up in a fading Rust Belt town especially, a funny nostalgic pull is present throughout the entire story, leading up to the dreadful encounter deep in the woods. I was super excited to revisit this game after six years, so let me show you everything interesting that I found. So let's start off with that title screen. The title screen is normally revealed by leaves moving aside, and then we see the logo behind that. But if we pull things back, we can find all the associated screens side by side. And this makes sense given how the menu view actually moves around when different things are selected. We can see some branches from the trees go off screen and are never actually seen, as they are background assets. And zooming all the way out, overall we have this plus sign like shape that contains all the different menu options on the title screen. So as the game starts off, May can be found inside the bus station. She meets the janitor, who then asks her for a soda. So then May goes up to the vending machine and grabs one. Now off camera, beneath the map, we can find a floating copy of May's arm and the front of the soda machine. And this copy is activated when we go to reach for the soda. This isn't the only thing hidden here though, as this bus station used to look a lot different and we can actually turn back on the old look of the bus station. And you can see how it used to be different. There was a ticket booth and not a desk, and there was a row of seats next to a pamphlet station. The iconic Possum Springs photo is gone too. So moving outside the bus station, there isn't really a whole lot other than some trees that were moved, but this is what the whole map looks like from far away. Moving on to the next section, the ravine in the woods was always a really cool map, and we can see how it was built in layers as we move through it. But above this map is a 3D cube, which is interesting because it's one of the few full 3D assets in this game. And I'm going to be honest, I'm not sure why it's there, and it's simply called Cube. So the next area in the introduction of the game, we have the playground. And this area is really cool for a lot of different reasons, because apparently the playground went through some changes. Underneath the map, we can find a horizontal black bar. But we can also find a duplicate object of the same black bar turned off in this empty area. Turns out, there used to be plans for a seesaw and a swing set over here. And Mall Cop isn't on the map yet either, as you can see. But we can restore the developer version of the seesaw. So this version is a bit too thin though, and May can easily fall through it when trying to walk on it. So it doesn't work very well. A single seat to a swing set can be loaded in too, but it doesn't sway like a swing. It's basically just a small platform. If we go underground, we'll see that the black bar beneath the stage is a seesaw too. This one functions a lot better, and it makes it so that May walks in it like she's walking a tightrope or power line. Back up top, the remaining assets for the scene don't load in until we go to that top power line. So, if we were to warp past the fence, we'll see our aunt's flashlight click on, but she won't be there. It creates a pretty interesting cutscene. Once we make it inside May's house, we can see it has two layers to it. Normally, one of the floors gets obscured at a time, but this is what both look like. And something that I found was neat is that May's eyes are designed to always look at who she's talking to. So moving her around the scene while in conversation, we'll still have her look where she's supposed to. Now, throughout the game, we can open May's journal as well. And similar to the vending machine from earlier, we can find her journal and her hands stored way out of bounds to the bottom left. 
Opening the journal, while the journal is visible, is interesting, and we can see how it gets pulled in front of the camera and then blurs out the background behind it, regardless of what's in the camera's view. Outside May's house, we have the sorta busy streets of Possum Springs. We can see that the three kids who run by at the start eventually reach the end of the map and just sit there. We can also see how the cars in this area load and unload at the edges of the map as well. They sit there for a second before a different car loads into that same space. Now, there is an invisible wall that blocks off the construction area, but if we restore a deactivated power line at the start of the game, we can see that this invisible wall stretches upwards quite a ways too. If we were to skip over this and try to cross over, we can see that we will just fall off the map to our doom. So the next part of the town has a similar situation with the cars moving back and forth. However, it's kind of neat because the buildings still have developer whiteboxing within them. Lots of the windows around here have text associated with them that was probably used at some point for planning what they should contain. For example, one says, head pop-up window. Another two windows are specifically labeled as special windows with a green overlay. And then we have the most important of all, a window labeled the cat window. So here you can see a wide shot of the map with all the green window locations before we move on to another part of the town. So probably the most robust part of town, this next area looks pretty cool from far away. We can see that the raccoon animal on this map doesn't move its legs when it walks near the edge of the map, which is pretty interesting. We can also see the other NPCs turn around at the map edge. This map has some hidden things on it as well. One window has deactivated developer text that says smell that cooking. And then there is this weird black pole that is in the center of the map. Lastly, there's a gradient rectangle overlay that is in front of the map for some reason. The last part of town before the outskirts features some more tall buildings, the Snack Falcon and the Click Clack Diner. Oddly, there are some leftover buildings out of bounds off the right side of the map. Heading over to the Click Clack Diner, where the arm cutscene takes place, we can find all the associated characters floating way above the city in the corner of the map. Even Ant Mall Cop is here. This area features some more of those windows with text that the other areas had too. Moving past this point, we come to the edge of town with the abandoned food donkey, which we'll be checking out later. Normally, Ide runs off the map beyond this fence, and I was always curious what was actually past this fence. When I walked over here, I noticed May was looking up into the sky. And it turns out both B and Angus are stored above the hill out of bounds. Moving them back to the map makes it so we can talk to them, but they don't say anything, given the game's sequence of events are currently broken. Past this fence though, the hill leads up and off screen and just cuts off, as to be expected, but the ground over here can't actually be walked on. We just fall straight through it. Before we dip out of Possum Springs, we're gonna head over to the bridge area just outside of town. In the top left corner of this map, we can find a floating germ who looks like he is falling, and a copy of Rabies the Possum. It looks like both of their assets are stored up here possibly for the hangouts that can take place in this area. But now that we've covered the main sections of Possum Springs, let's dive into Greg's part of the story. When I first played through this game, I missed most of this because I stuck with B's story. But smashing light bulbs with a baseball bat is an experience worth checking out. So normally, May is stuck on top of this dumpster, and when Greg tosses us a bulb, he then goes off screen. If we look at this from the side, we can see that Greg immediately turns around with a bulb the second he gets out of view. Occasionally, he'll hit us with a can as well. So if we follow a thrown bulb, we can see it almost goes off the map before shattering. Getting hit with a can in slow motion is kind of neat too. So like I said, normally May can't move off of his dumpster, but we can modify the game to put her elsewhere, and we can now run around this entire scene now. We cannot hit Greg with our bat though, in case you were curious, but we can make tossing those light bulbs from his perspective very intimidating. So the next scene I want to talk about is actually that very iconic bike ride through the woods. So this scene captures fall perfectly. It was nice to just watch all the scenery go by as Greg pedaled through the woods. So off camera, there is a tree clipping through the ground at one part and sort of flickering. And if we slow down the scene, we can also see the dynamic duo up close. It's very interesting how the scene is layered to create the sweeping landscape. If we go to the very end, we can see some trees that the player never sees. And off camera, near the front of the scene is a bunch of trees left behind floating in the void. So right after we get done biking, we end up getting into this knife fight with Greg and May. And you can see from this angle that we are just floating arms. Now, this is not surprising given what we can see in this minigame, but it is neat to see this from this perspective. 
this scene always reminded me of a very painful game that kids played in the 90s, where you would slide a quarter into someone's knuckles and the first person to bleed would lose. It's also very interesting that right after they screw up their hands, they then take the crossbow out into the woods and shoot at the forest god decoy. This would be very painful if your knuckles were wounded. So viewing this from another angle, we can see what this full landscape actually looks like. What's interesting is that there are a few things turned off in this scene. For one, there's an extra part of the hill that is invisible that we can toggle on and off. But what's pretty neat is that we still have the stand-in artwork for the Forest God, as it is set to inactive in this scene. This developer mock-up was probably made so that the crossbow firing system could be created before the final artwork was done for the Forest God. So what we were left with is this blue outline of the beast. Back in the actual forest map, we can see that the pond reflection is exactly that, a mirrored version of the world. There's also some stand-in birds before they were animated and replaced. Now, these were the first hangouts I checked out off camera, but you'll know these hangouts weren't in order. So let's go back to that food donkey now. Normally, you break into the food donkey with Greg and Steve and eventually steal one of the mascots in the back. We can load into this map by ourselves though, and none of the normal functions work here. Checking out of bounds, we can find some interesting things though. For one, the store just ends right after the masks on the wall. Normally, you can't see this, but it comes to a wall. And up above the map, we can find a headless Greg shuffling around. We can move him back to the map, and with some more tinkering, we can eventually put his head back on. He doesn't have any eyes though, for some reason, so he's a bit creepy. Moving over to Greg's apartment, we can find all the characters stored here. None of them have anything to say, but by default, they'll be standing in the center if no story progression has taken place in the game. We can manually add our robot spoils back to the scene though, as we make the crate appear. The robot assembly minigame doesn't really have anything hidden per se, but we can put all three heads on a robot at once, which is pretty dope. So when we go to power this monstrosity up, we can see that May's arm is just cut off at the bottom when she's reaching up for the button. And after we get zapped, our three-headed monster just squirms back and forth on Greg's couch. And then Angus strolls on in. Previously, when May and Greg took this battery, May does get shocked and she has this very trippy Sharkle dream. Now, when the Sharkle dream is taking place, moving the camera at all makes Sharkle sort of glitch out. As you can see, the colors around them are sort of being distorted. When we wake up, it's possible to break the sequence of events and restore movement to May. However, um, as you can see, she's just sliding around on the floor back and forth, and occasionally we get this flicker of a running animation. We can also jump while she's laying down, which is kind of funny. Now, I have some trouble trying to get the car riding scene to load in on the way to the Donut Wolf. However, when we get to the Donut Wolf, there's plenty of things that we can check out. So May goes into the bathroom and she is not having it. So she decides to trash the place. And the first thing she does is dispense all the toilet paper onto the ground. Now, if we remove the silhouettes from this scene, we can see a lot more. And as you can see, the toilet paper continuously spawns in as May further depletes it. And the piles that rise up are actually these circular objects. Now, the funny thing is we can activate this same sequence multiple times by resetting this scene. And each time, as you can see, the toilet paper will get longer and longer. In fact, if we do this a second time, the toilet paper cutscene never ends. So we are free to drain this toilet paper as long as we want, and it will get further and further below the map. So right after the toilet paper, for some reason, the mirror scratching event has a double-sided arm. I'm not sure why this is the case, but it is. And moving on to the toilet, we can see that when May stomps on the toilet and flushes it, that it's a floating arm and leg that pulls off this animation. So it looks a bit goofy from this perspective. Then of course, this double-sided arm comes back for stuffing the hand dryer. Also, Greg is gonna wear the helmet everywhere we go now because I broke the sequence of events, so I hope you get used to it. So now when it comes to eating donuts with Greg and Angus, we can actually turn off their bodies so it's only May sitting at the table. And this is kind of funny because now it's only May grabbing the donuts. No one else grabs donuts. So by the time May passes out from a sugar coma, there's still plenty of donuts left on the table that normally are gone. So when we come to, we spawn outside of the donut wolf. And because things are broken, Greg and Angus won't say anything to us and they'll just be standing there. However, because of this, we can kind of just walk off the map though and fall to our death onwards to the historical society. 
So as you're breaking into the basement, you're normally in these dark woods. We could take this existing lighting though and make things brighter so we can see full outlines of this area. We can now see that as we're fumbling with the flashlight, the owl that attacks Greg just spawns in the middle of the woods and swoops down to attack him. Once aside, the historical society is actually kind of neat because all the floors are loaded in at once and they are blocked out by black edging on the screen. Disabling everything, we can take a look at the whole interior at once, and it looks pretty cool this way. So as for hidden things, there are some leftover alpha windows on the map where the exit sign is that can be toggled on and off. And there is also a different lighting setup for the spiral staircase as well. Inside the map room, we can find the whole map of Possum Springs. But there's also a hidden alpha map too that used to be a placeholder. We can see that each section is marked by a number that represents the button that would light up the area. Now, when someone starts to pursue us through the area in the elevators, we can see that off camera, nothing actually happens. It's simply sound effects and no other characters are loaded in. However, outside, we of course had the fire escape. If we watch Greg run down it, he will actually just warp from the very end of it to below the map. As we run down, Ide appears in the window. And if we remove the window entirely, we can see that Ide's graphic is semi-transparent like a ghost. When we finally jump off the fire escape, we can see that we fall out of bounds way beneath where Greg is. But now that we covered Greg's main story elements, why don't we hop into May's Bizarre Dreams? One of May's first dreams has her smashing things with a baseball bat in the astral town of Dirk Killesburg, which is assumed to be the name of the town she went to for college. Pulling the camera back, we can see how this dreamscape was made. We can also take a close-up look at May smashing the cars. What's kind of neat is that when you scare away the birds, they will keep moving forever, farther and farther away off screen. But we're here to smash the founder's statue, and we can take a look at it in slow motion as well. Now, this dream doesn't have much hidden in it, but the dreams following this one do. Once we reach the second act, we can enter this sweeping landscape with telephone wires crisscrossing under the moon. At the very top of this map, we can find a static image of May standing still. But way out of bounds, we can find a hidden room too. It's strange, but it looks like this was a mock-up scene for a landscape. I didn't realize how these were tied to the map until I reached the second dream in Act 2 though. In this dream, we have many slanted buildings. There is a copy of May off to the top left, like before, and a room, hidden way out of bounds. This room has a path of ground leading to it, but there's also this text that says, Ghosts Eating Dinner. In the same room, we can see that there's a door behind May as well. So what's really cool about this whole thing is that this is actually a leftover secret that never made it into the final game. I mean, quite literally, this area is labeled as a secret inside the game's code. So it turns out there actually used to be a door on this map that you could go up to and open and it would warp you into this small room. And the door location used to be in front of this house that you can see right here. And as you can see, we have this animated icon popping up letting us know there is a trigger in this spot. And entering this door without any tweaks to programming takes us over to this secret room. Now I can't say for certain what this was, but my hunch is that each dream had a secret area that you could find. And although this room didn't get out of the development stage, based on the text, we can assume that walking into this room, we may have seen a bunch of ghostly figures, like those shadowy figures we see in the dreams, a bunch of them eating dinner or at a bar or something, while May was free to explore the foreground while they were in the background. Essentially, shapes in the background and nothing more. However, that is of course just speculation. Exiting this area through the door takes us back over to the map again, and we can no longer enter the house. When hopping over to the next dream, where we were in Possum Springs near the train station, we can see that the train is stored out of bounds off to the right when it isn't active. Up top is yet another May, and way off in the distance at the end of the train is yet another hidden room. This room says Ghosts Shoveling Coal, and just like the previous map, there was once a warp that led you over here. We can see that we're able to run around this room, and if we were to exit, we would appear on top of the smoking chimney at the edge of the map within this dreamscape. I'm not sure if you originally walked into a door, or if you went down this pipe like Mario, but this secret area was accessible at one point in development. Act 3's dream, with all the fish swimming through the jumbled mess of buildings, looks really cool while zoomed out. And as you may have guessed, this map is similar to the rest. We could take a look at the floating bodies up close, which is a bit eerie, and then there's a copy of May up top, but there's also a set of trees out of bounds on this map too, not too far from the copy of May. The secret door on this map was actually this window up top. Going into this window would warp us off to the right, and this time it puts us in an invisible room way out of bounds. 
The exit door is still there though, and we can leave. Now last, but certainly not least, we have the final dreamlike encounter in the game, which is the Cat God. Normally, May runs across this barren astral landscape with the moon in the background. It turns out this map used to look a bit different though. Hidden in the files, we can find a fence and several lanterns that guide the way to the Cat God. They probably removed these because making the landscape completely barren makes the encounter feel more ominous. Nothing man-made resides here, only the universe and our inner self. I could see why they removed these. But with that, we've come to the end of our deep dive with Greg's story, Possum Springs, and the dream sequences. Let me know if you enjoyed this video, and if you'd like to see B-side of the story alongside other things that I missed. Thanks for watching, and cheers!